there, and the life of God is not my way to get what I want. I think a lot of us seek us that way, almost like it's a magic formula. You know, if I pray in the name of Jesus, then of course Jesus will do whatever I ask, right? Isn't that what the scripture says? And therefore, when it doesn't happen the way I want, we have this big crisis of faith. But honestly, I really believe in most of my experience that those are really the cries of a three-year-old who is not getting her way. Even when we're talking about serious, serious situations, because the scripture speaks of a different way of life. It speaks of a way of life that actually the more you live into the life of the Savior, the more you can in fact expect adversity and difficulty. And why do you think that is? It's not because God's mean. He's trying to get at stuff inside of us that wants us to have our way and for things to go the way we would like them to go. And it can be just as small as you know, I've been working the flowers at this church for 25 years, and nobody's ever said thank you. I'm serious, so maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. Understanding that the gift of flowers on the altar is, in fact, an offering to God. That's really its point. Now, I, I'm with you. Everybody needs and wants to be appreciated and thanked, and I, no one is immune from that. So I'm not in some ways letting a church off the hook by not honoring the directress of the flower guild. But I also want to say is, is that if, you've keep, if you're keeping a tally in your brain of how many times you get appreciated and the times that you don't, and that begins to determine where you say yes and where you say no, you're not on God's ball field. You're doing something else. Because, frankly, what God is trying to do is break, there's a line, there's a Christian rapper by the name of Taran Wells, and I like him immensely, and he has this line in one of his songs called, Breaking My Plastic Heart. And that, to me, sums up in a very clear way exactly what the Holy Spirit in, is after in the fire of his work the discipline that is spoken of in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, to literally bend us, make us pliable, so that we know how to yield, so that we are okay with not being acknowledged or taking the higher place. Because, you know, you don't get it. You just don't, aren't going to get it. The appreciation will never measure up to the amount of sacrifice. Period. Did you hear me? The appreciation you receive will never measure up to the amount of sacrifice ever. Ever. And what, do you, what does that mean? Well, I know, I just have to tough it out, don't I? No. It's a way of God saying, for whom are you doing this? Because if you're still keeping the tally, what's going on is that you're trying to be a martyr. You're not forgiving, you're not letting go, you're trudging on dutifully, head held high. But what's not present is the gentleness of the Savior that is still willing to pick up the cup when no one else saw it. Who's willing to go and do, play, do things that were not expected of you, particularly if they actually take you out of the limelight as opposed to placing you in it. Oh, but I'm not one of those people. I'm not a limelight person. In fact, I shun the limelight. The last place I want to be is in center stage. I'm just happy to stay in the kitchen and do the work that needs to be done. And I've seen God do it again and again. Sometimes those are the very people that God says, oh, that means I can actually trust you with a little bit of the limelight, and it's not going to go to your head because you're willing to step out and do something like this knowing that you have nothing to be able to give unless God gives it to you. And therefore, out of that, that act of obedience, you will step into that place. I am always nervous about clergy, especially, who are ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that because people, God has a wonderful way of breaking it. And sometimes it's very public and embarrassing. 
because the humility that God desires to work in his children is far more important than any accolade from anybody. And he is after melting our plastic hearts. And that's what takes me to this. I know both Joe Bailey Wells and Janet Eccles made a good bit of the difference between the person who wants safety and the person who is adventurous. Well, I want to say to you, regardless of whether that's your temperament or not, because some of that is temperament, just the way you've been wired. God will use you regardless of what your preferences are. You just have to be sure that it's okay if he doesn't honor your preferences all the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I look at it this way. Who are the kind of person that you are? You're invited to a dinner party. And you may be the kind of person who goes to things like that out of obligation. You really don't like parties. Small talk is not your forte. And you'd just be, rather be the kind of person who goes and hides out in the kitchen. And so when you show up, you greet the hostess, and immediately what you say to her is, may I help? And you make a beeline to the kitchen, regardless of what is, whether you're needed there or not, because the last thing you want to do is stand in the middle of a living room and hold a drink in your hand and make small talk with people that you may, may or may not even like. I want to say to you, that's a false choice. Because people who have that kind of safety introvert mentality are some of the keenest observers of human nature I know. In other words, their quietness has enhanced their gift to see in a way that people who are extroverted, who make conversation and love, they don't notice. Not the same way. And it may be in that situation that God is calling you, who would rather go, you know, load trays and things like that, to out into the room. And you walk in and you go, okay, God, where would you have me go? Who's sitting by herself, trying to look like she's being included, but really not, and she knows it? Is that the person you want me to sit down with and talk to? In other words, there is a gift in the temperament that God has given you to reach out in ways that might be contrary to your nature. But believe me, the extroverted leader will never notice, ever. Because they have a whole different orientation. They want to make connections and meet people and talk and, and enjoy their company and be grateful for the food and all of that sort of thing. And there's a, there is a role for that kind of sort of raucous gratitude. You know, we love people like that. But I want to say to you that it may be that if you're that kind of person, God might be the one saying, I think you need to go help out in the kitchen. <laughs> because in both ways... God is again trying to melt that plastic heart of ours and really make us servants. Because honestly, this is what servanthood is what this represents. Servanthood is what this represents. And to do that and to say no to your own inclination, who would much rather do the opposite of where the direction is going is exactly what's going on in Elisha. It's exactly what's going on in the gospel reading where Jesus is saying the very same things. And in both cases, you will have to sort of take a deep breath inside and say, okay, this is God's agenda for me for tonight. I will embrace it by the mercy of God. And you never know what will happen in those individual conversations. And you will be bold enough, if the opportunity arises, to not just say as they are sharing something with you, well, I'll be thinking about you, but to actually even say, I will be praying for you. And make that bold connection that is contrary to all of our need to be liked. But that in fact is what it means to be an agent of the kingdom of God whether it is in the living room or whether it's in the kitchen, whether it's the person you're standing at the dry cleaner and you just, somebody starts talking to you. 
my mother was like that. She'd show up in places and all of a sudden a stranger would just start telling his whole story. And you need to know, my mother is now with Jesus in glory. She was about this tall. And uh, kind of a, sort of the epitome in some ways of this gentle, etiquette trained Southern lady. And at first she was, what is this person doing? But she began to see it actually as a part of the calling that God gave her for her life. And so she would engage. And as a Christian woman, she would say, well, I will be praying for you. Lorelei teased my wife, teases me, because I have this ministry, she says, to waiters. And what happens is, is that when Marie or John or whatever, hi, my, my name is Michael, and I'm going to be your server. Hi, Michael, how are you? I always ask that. And before the evening is over, if the opportunity again arises, I wind up getting with Michael, if I can, and say, Michael, I want you to know I've been praying for you all during this dinner. Is there anything I should be praying for? And see what Michael has to say. I'm astonished at how many people respond. That's kitchen ministry. That's the apron. That's the willingness to be a servant wherever you are. And why is that the case? Because the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. And who is that? That's been you and me. In other words, I've been rescued by the blood of Christ. I am the one who was taken out of nowhere and brought into the kingdom of God. I was the one, based on the faith of my family and plenty of other people, who wound up coming up and saying things to me like, have you ever thought about the ordained ministry? Which I thought was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> and became agents that God used to speak a direction into the life of this very lost high school student who lived, who lived for the approval of other people. That's who I was. I could be an actor and walk in and say hello and command the room, but inside it was a behavior I, I used to be able to gain other people's friendship. It was not who I was inside. God had to do great healing in me to take me from there to here. Okay. And that's this. You see, this, if it's fulfilling its purpose, is full of water. And you're on this journey. And you may have felt the anointing of God when you got up in the morning. But all of a sudden, it's 10 o'clock and it's hot outside. And you've got work to do. And the last thing you need is to have to make an unscheduled route to the grocery store, for crying out loud. Or whether you're at the office and somebody's asking you to run copies. Or I need to see you just 10 minutes. And you know it's for 45 at least. <laughs> and it happens again and again and again. I've had to learn that I need replenishment. I need replenishment if I'm going to stay a servant rather than being irritated at people getting in the way of what I feel like I should do, because I'm one of those people who starts the day with a list. And a good day for me means everything got checked off the list. God goes, ha, I have a different list. <laughs> and so the interruptions just come. And it takes grace, replenishment, to not see those people as interruptions, but to see them as people. People, people whom God loves and cares about. Because if I'm a servant, I am not the center of my own universe. If, I, if there's ever something I ought to put on my bathroom mirror in the morning, I am not the center of my own universe. People do not live to do what I want. Get over yourself. Lastly, the fan. What I did do with the fan, well, what I wound up doing with the fan at the dinner, I said, this was actually, were handed out. Remember, again, this is, this is a true story. I, it is 1967, and I am at a funeral. And this is what we all got. All of us were in heavy dress clothes. Uh, there was no such thing as breathable fabric back then. And I am 15 years old, and a friend of mine has died, and I am there at the funeral. 
And so I'm in a suit. I don't like wearing suits, at least not when I was that age especially. And it's hot because it's packed. And people are going on and on and on and on. And I'm just doing this, trying to get through. Well, this came out not just as a way to advertise the name of the funeral home and help you remember it. It's actually a real act of kindness. And that's, you see, what this is meant to represent to us. It's not just giving up and saying, I'm going to go do what Jesus tells me to do, but you're going to run into interruptions. You're going to do things that you didn't expect. You're going to have to be the one to still pick up the cup. It doesn't matter your position. It does not matter your responsibility. Sometimes staying in your lane actually is being the hidden service servant that nobody else notices. Beloved, we cannot do these things unless we are holding on to the strong hand of Jesus. And what allows that to be true is nothing less than the daily understanding that who I am is a forgiven sinner. I will never be any more than that. And in fact, in the universe, that is a place of honor beyond anything we could ever imagine. And that life means I'm willing to take the hand of Jesus, even go into places of sacrifice out of sheer gratitude. Listen to Charles Wesley. And can it be that I should gain an entrance in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused him pain for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? It still takes my breath away. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head, clothed in righteousness divine. So out of that, boldly, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. The place that he has given me as his redeemed child, promised a life in heaven, given the wonderful joy of entering into places of great hardship and difficulty. Because you see, if I know who I am, if I know whose I am, I don't need to draw back into fear. Even if high cost is being asked of me, and while there'll be plenty of people quivering on the sidelines, wondering what's going to happen or what people are going to think of me, a part of the responsibility, daughters of you and me and all of us who have said yes to Jesus, is to step in the gap, go against our nature, say the uncomfortable things, that's a part of the call of evangelism, and be men and women who in the midst of profound division, still make room for people with whom we disagree because they are one in Christ, still see the need in front of us and not let the politics blind us to the need, but continue to reach out for people who have no other helper and to be the witness of Jesus who says to all, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that is demonstrated by what we do that in fact offers rest to people who do not know that. I said to you last night, and I'm done, I'm almost done. I said to you last night that it was not coincidental that on the day that the Supreme Court reversed Roe versus Wade, what this group of women did was raise money made blankets, God, that was wonderful, and donated literally a room full of goods to a ministry that cares for women and children. I have to tell you, regardless of where you stand on all of that, one way or the other, if either of those positions keeps you from reaching out to places and people like that, you've got it wrong even if you claim biblical authority for what it is that you believe. Beloved, that is, in fact, the litmus test. Not, did, not that you can quote the Bible. It's easy to weaponize the Bible for our own religious purposes. Far more important is the capacity to be able to say, okay, Lord, you said I was hungry. You said I was thirsty. You said I was in prison. Lord, where would you have me go? and be willing to enter into the day, whether it's 
the interruption at the office, or something far more weighty in the need of a person, and you can't, you can't let it go. You just see them. Final story. When I was a rector in Philadelphia, there was, um, that was a while ago, and there was a woman on my staff, a priest, and she came into staff meeting, and she was deeply troubled. And I, you know, once you see that, you just can't act like it's not there. And sure enough, I mean, I had an agenda for the meeting, but it was clear that something needed to be done. So I turned to her and I said, well, what's going on? She said, this was when Ceausescu was toppled in Romania as the dictator. And what happened was when people went inside Romania, one of the many atrocities that they found was warehouses of children with AIDS. And she said, she'd read an article in the paper about it, and she said, I just cannot get those children out of my mind. It will not let me go. And I said to Elizabeth, I said, well, Elizabeth, maybe God is asking you to think about that and do something. If God has put that on your heart and you can't let it go even though you'd rather let it go, that might be a part of the finger of God. And so she looked at me like, gee, thanks. <laughs> and and I, long story short, she actually wound up founding a nonprofit organization called Aiding Romania's Children. She corralled pharmaceutical companies, physicians, nurses, and assistants to go bring in train, uh, plane loads of medical supplies people working with the local doctors and nurses who were there in Romania, providing all that they could to be able to serve those people in need, until eventually, over the course of several years, the warehouses were empty. Now, I, that's what I mean. You never know. But the call is, if you're in this hand, God is looking, and he's looking at your circumstances and your heart, and there will be times when he'll go, don't say no. Why? Because the Savior has already said yes to you. For no, that's the only reason, because the Savior already said yes to you. And aiding Romania's children became the meeting of a need in that emerging country. So, we hold on to the hand of the Savior. We have said yes to him. I asked you the first night, will you go? And you said, yeah. So here we are. <laughs> you get an apron, which means you're willing to go wherever the Savior directs you. Even if it is contrary to your personality and preferences, the Lord will use your personality to open your eyes to see needs that others do not, including, remember, the woman in the living room who was trying to look like she was being included but clearly was not. Secondly, you will get the, what you need for the journey. The Holy Spirit is living within you. The companionship of the presence of Jesus never goes away, regardless of the difficulty, even regardless of the presence of sin. Because, sisters, who is without sin? Not me. If somehow there was a quid pro quo, the presence of Jesus shows up or I sin, and if I sin, I lose the presence of Jesus, I'd have to quit. This is always here. I will never leave you or forsake you. And then lastly, the Lord will open your eyes and give you all that you need to be able to provide a need that is bigger than your capacity to be able to meet it. People will not like it. You will be gossiped about, talked about. It'll challenge your need to be respected and liked. It'll knock you off your desire to be in the highest place but I'd rather be with Jesus than be in the highest place if being in the highest place is being all by myself. And it's to all of that when we come to this table of sacrifice that represents the body and blood of Jesus to which we are saying yes. Thank you. Thank you that you are saying yes.
Thank you that you're willing to say, I'm only one, but I'm one. And wherever you are, your parish, your community, you're not just hiding out. You've taken up all that God has given you. And you are looking for ways to serve. Janet was right. You and the daughters of the king could in fact be the key to the renewal of your congregation, no matter who is rector. You could be the key to your community, no matter what the laws are or who's in political power. You could be the key to bring people to Jesus who are terrified of anything remotely related to religion because they have been abused by it rather than blessed by it. Those are tough, tough places. Go there. And God will use you. I promise. Amen. Affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Who is leading our prayers of the people? In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of For those serving in our armed forces here and abroad, for peace between Russia and Ukraine, for peace in Jerusalem and all across Europe, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For persecuted churches, for the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all For all archbishops and bishops represented by this gathering, for Greg, our national chaplain, for Eugene, Joe, Glenda, Deborah, William, Margaret, Jocelyn, Janet, Darlene, Maria, Elena, Connie, Marcia, Nan, Barb, Peggy, Lydia, Joan, Adriana, 
and for all bishops and other ministers, and for all who serve God in his church, for the special needs and concerns of all who are here at this triennial and those we left at home, and for all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Silently or aloud, please add your own thanksgivings. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Tony. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. So hold us by your spirit. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Okay, please be seated. Thank you. Um, we, a couple of things to which I need to call your, to your attention, as well as what we have to walk through in terms of the service of installation of officers. First of all, uh, we need clergy and limbs who are willing to come and consume the leftover consecrated elements at the conclusion of your, the service. Please just come right up here. Um, secondly, if people who are here are, have assistance, need assistance, or have assistance in walkers or wheelchairs, it would be better, if at all possible, for you to use the station over there. And the reason is, that's where the aisle is the widest. I, this configuration is not exactly what happened on Wednesday, and we have no control over that. And so that means the aisles are narrower. So if you would, you can use any one you want. But I just want to say, to, for it easier, that might be helpful. Also, um, at least one person has told me that her flight was canceled. She is now being rerouted to Minneapolis for an eight-hour layover. And then is going to get up on a plane. Uh, if you please ask around, if you make sure that everybody is going to be okay and get where they need to go. And in fact, this particular woman wondered if there was anybody in Minneapolis who could pick her up and get her home and then get her back so that she wouldn't be spending the night, as it were, in an airport chair. Um, 
So uh, if there's anybody who's willing to do that, that's, that's like tonight. Um, check, let's see, if you could just meet out there and she'll know, just wave your hand and believe me, the person who needs that will let you know. Um, also, I understand that a woman named Hyacinth lost her daughter's bag and it has a bunch of extra water in it that she will need for her flight. Uh, if you, any of you know where that is or see it, and if it, or if you've got a bag around you that winds up actually not being yours, uh, if you could also get that out there. Um, I think that's it. Oh, the other thing, just to remind you, is that the gluten-free station is going to be right over here in front of the uh, doors. Now, if you will, uh, let's move on, please, to the service of installation of officers. The National Council of the Order of the Daughters of the King has completed another term of service, and well they have served, I might add. We acknowledge and appreciate the efforts you have made, all made, to strengthen the order and carry out its mission in the church and in <laughs> the world. <laughs> the officers have given much of themselves to complete their tasks and have fulfilled their duties with love and devotion, and we thank you. Hear, hear. The members and officers of the new National Council of the Order, having been duly elected, are here presented for installation. Sisters in Christ, if you would please come up. to the new National Council. The order commits itself to your direction and leadership with every assurance that you will devote yourselves to the good of the order and the furtherance of its purposes. The members look to you for guidance, inspiration, and leadership. Will you endeavor to fulfill these obligations to the best of your ability as a member of the National Council of the Orders of the Daughters of the King? Congregation, do you, members of the order here assembled, express your confidence in and pledge your cooperation to this new council? We will. Will you pray that God may give this council wisdom, courage, and strength to do his will and prove themselves worthy of this great trust? Electing officers of the National Council, you have been chosen as officers for the ensuing term President, Vice President, Secretary, and Treasurer. These offices will demand your time, energy, thought, and enthusiasm. The success of the next term will depend in no small measure upon your devotion and fidelity. We pray that God will strengthen you, strengthen you for your tasks. Receiving now the responsibility placed upon you, will you agree to devote yourselves to the task that your office demands, continually seeking to be used by our Lord Jesus Christ? Cresida, you have something to say. To Billis, that's right. Actually, I have two to bless. One is the one that will be given to, San, to Nancy as the new president, and the other will be given to Cressida as the outgoing president. 
Let us pray. Gracious God, I thank you for these women who have said yes to you, who are willing to bear these crosses gladly and publicly, always identifying themselves where they, wherever they are to the purpose that you have given them, the higher purpose to be a daughters, of the, daughters of the King. So bless, Lord, these crosses. Let them always be reminders that you use, both in their lives and the lives of those who see them, that above all, we honor Jesus as crucified Savior and Lord, and we operate under his service and for his glory. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Crusita. Crusita, we present you with this gold cross of the order, were it always, were it always, to remind you of your faithful service to the order and as an enduring token of our appreciation. Now, Nancy, do you in the presence of this congregation commit yourself to the new trust and responsibility placed on you as president of the Order of the Daughters of the King? I do with God's help. Congregation, would you who witnessed this change in leadership support and uphold Nancy in this ministry? May Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, grant you also the strength and power to perform them, so that he may accomplish the work he has begun in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is always the toughest part of the service. Sisters, if you, we will, you will please say this together. As daughters, we will grace forgive. The service of rededication. Who is to lead that? Well, it says president. Okay, here we go. Members of the Order of the Daughters of the King are gathered here in the sight of God to rededicate to this rule of life, a vow of daily prayer, service, and evangelism. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
O Lord, show us your mercy. And grant us your salvation. O God, make clean our hearts within us. And take not your Holy Spirit from us. Together, strengthen us, O Lord, to think, do, and say always those things that are right. Enable us who cannot exist without you to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Order of the Daughters of the King is an order of women whose mission is the spread of Christ's kingdom, especially among women and girls, through prayer, service, and evangelism. Do you desire to continue your membership in the Order? Are you ready, so long as you remain a member of the order, to wear its cross faithfully and to work for its purposes as God may give you the opportunity? I am with God's help. Almighty and merciful God, since it is only by your gift that your faithful people do true and praiseworthy service, bless your servants who have signified their desire to continue in your holy, ser- holy service as members of the order of the Daughters of the King. Guide them to lead godly lives, to labor faithfully for the spread of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Together, Almighty and everlasting God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we here dedicate our whole lives to serve May the Holy Spirit guide and strengthen you that in this and in all things you may do God's will in the service of the kingdom of Christ. Amen. Amen. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Chrisita, here is the box your cross gave me. Yeah, go ahead.
Christ here of all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and the Holy All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the we give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Our Father. Father. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the final blessing, one brief loss. Chapter is lost. Please return to Judith Quarles or Joyce Thompson or Faustino Osborne. And I have their numbers if you need to ask about that. Is there another one, Janet? Mary Nicholson is who you're asking for? Okay. Um, there is a key ring with an elephant. Is that still missing? Okay, if anybody finds a key ring with elephant, we need to get it to the... Um, there's a black iPhone with a sticker on the back that's missing, and someone's eyeglasses are missing. And a black shark. There's a lot. There's blank evaluations on the hallway. Uh, there's Paris home donation bags are next to the boxes for the evaluations as you go out the door. Cash or check donations can be put inside the bags also. Uh, a hearing aid uh -oh. has been dropped on that side of the room. Please don't step on it. A hearing aid. <laughs> and if I could please see Elizabeth Groves at the conclusion of the service. And now the final blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. I think so. Mike, 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 I'm on now. Uh, it's been wonderful to see you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being sisterly. Um, please uh, have safe travels home. And the 2022 Triennial Meeting of the Order of the Daughters of the King is now adjourned.